Welcome to the Emotional Horsemanship Podcast. I am your host, Lockie Phillips, and I help deeply caring equestrians create emotionally balanced horses with science, empathy, and feel. This podcast is a safe place for anyone who desires a better future for horses and for the equestrian lifestyle. I hope that you will enjoy these solo and collaborative episodes where we enjoy a deep insight into our horses' worlds and ways in which we can make that better for them. If you love horses and are willing to do right by them, you're going to love this podcast. And I thank you for being here. My guest on the podcast is Elaine Hayes. Elaine Hayes is a friend, a client, and a colleague. Elaine is a boarding barn owner, a dressage rider, and trainer, and lives in North Carolina, USA. Partnership dressage is Elaine's lens on the development of correct classical sport horses to an extremely high level with kindness and respect. I have really enjoyed supporting Elaine on a few of the cases that she's called me in to advise her on. Elaine is also an advocate for quality breeding practices. After discovering ECVM in some of her horses, which resulted unfortunately in life-ending scenarios for these horses, Elaine put her entire business on the line to begin advocating for better breeding, diagnostics and awareness. Awareness around the bodies many horses are born with. ECVM, which has been discussed a few times in season one, together with many, many other genetic diseases of a horse's skeleton, is not always a doom and gloom diagnosis. It's not always a life-ending diagnosis, but genetic abnormalities do hold a very high prevalence of high potential for discomfort, pain, and potentially catastrophic dysfunction. Early studies indicate the possibility, but not yet proven fact, that an enormous percentage of today's domestic horses are bred with broken bodies. I hugely admire Elaine because she's taken on this cause. I admire anyone who speaks boldly to their truth and puts everything on the line passionately for causes that are important to them. Appearing on her first podcast ever here, it is my pleasure to introduce you to my friend and colleague, Elaine. Good day, everybody. Welcome to the Emotional Horsemanship Podcast. I'm joined by my friend, uh, off again, on again student as well, because we've worked together in that capacity, Elaine Hayes in North Carolina at Partnership Dressage. Hello, Elaine. Hello, Lucky. Thank you for having me. <laughs> you just put on your uh, call center voice. Did you Did you notice that? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> you just put on your call center voice, your client voice. Elaine, yeah. I'm, I'm going to yeah. start by, um, if I can, introducing you in my words, and then I'm going to ask you a big question and allow you to, to speak for yourself. But I'm going to pull this from your website. Um, on your website, it says to come join Elaine Hayes in a journey of self-discovery to become a better partner for your horse. She, Elaine, p- created Partnership Dressage to give competition horses a better deal. Though the many through the many years of showing, she has noticed her training approach of partnering with and listening to the horse are solely lacking in the competition arena because you don't know what you don't know. Many competition riders are told the horse must be a certain way to compete. Through Elaine's journey of self-discovery and looking inward, Elaine has found not only a more connected way to be with horses, but that these are that these ways of being actually improve performance as well. Elaine seeks to show them that there is a better, kinder, and more empathic way, not only to be with their horse, but also to bring out the best qualities in their horse so they can shine in competition. Yeah, that Thank sounds you. about right. Thank you. <laughs> you know, and there are a lot of uh, dressage folk, competitive dressage folk or former competitive dressage folk who speak to that. Even Cesar mm-hmm. Para, his website was was going on and on like this. <laughs> 
But the reason why I'm yeah. having you here on my podcast is because I've worked with you both online and in person. You actually walk that talk, Elaine Hayes. So Elaine Hayes, please let us know who you are, what you do, and how you do it. Okay. Well, um, I am a classical dressage instructor um, and a dressage trainer. I also focus on horsemanship. Um, I'm sort of in the middle of a journey of becoming or maybe going back to uh, a more uh, root-centered um approach i've sort of i've i've showed for gosh over 30 years now it's probably about 30 years. years you competed for 30 Long. years to what yeah. level <laughs> to what level um grand, grand prix grand prix yeah all right all the way yeah, up grand prix. yes so I've, I've trained several horses um all the way to grand prix several other horses to fei both my personal horses and client horses um, and I was pretty immersed in the in the competition world um, from a fairly young age. And uh, recently, as in last year, I had a, a series of events happen to me that sort of completely changed the direction of my business and how I focus on uh, serving my clients, but more importantly, probably serving the horses. Mm -hmm. So do you want, how much do you want me to go in depth on that? <laughs> I am fascinated that someone who has trained multiple horses from scratch to Grand Prix is even interested in talking to me um, and, <laughs> and then let alone has, has booked me for, for sessions and attended a clinic. That already tells me that between your ears and in between your shoulders where your heart lives, that there's something there that many people in that system have proven through their behavior they don't have. So this is true. <sighs> yes. What is it like? Do you want to know what is it like? Okay. What well, what was it like to take multiple horses up to that level? What was that like for you? And what did you see in that place? Um, so let me go back a little bit. Yes, please. Um, when I was a, when I was a teenager, so I started in 4-H, um, in, I'm from Michigan originally, mm -hmm. and I had the good fortune of just being in the right place at the right time. And I had a German, a wonderful man, Bodo Hangen, who was a writer. He had come over to work at Temple Lipid Saunas, which was in Chicago at the time. And he basically was my first introduction to dressage. And he mm -hmm. was the real deal classical. I mean, mm -hmm. not, I mean, he was, he learned from, you know, the greats. He was the most empathetic, uh, genuine. He kind of got in trouble. He had a little bit of a potty mouth and he didn't have a large clientele because of it. And he was also very horse first once he left Temple. Um, and he was also gay in the early 80s. He actually died of AIDS, sadly. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was terrible to lose him. Um, but I, I always had that foundation. So when I moved into the competition world after college, um, you know, my dream was always to be a horse trainer and own a, a farm. That's always what I wanted to do. Um, I sort of got involved with the, you know, I'll just say American dressage. I'm okay. Just Okay. Away, as that. okay. Um, and I met lots of people, Olympians, you know, and I, I sort of got immersed in in that culture, but I had this really, really sound base. And I just knew. And of course, you know, Lockie, um, I love horses. Like I love horses so much. Mm. So when I was confronted with those systems, even though they told me, you have to do this. You want to be the best. You know, we're going to be the best, but you have to do these things. And I just, I did them, but I was not comfortable with it ever. Um, and it got to the point where 
I had a mare at the time, the one horse in my whole career that if I could take one back, it would be her. <laughs> she just happened to be in that time period in my life. And, you know, <laughs> not surprisingly, she started rearing in that system. And because I didn't start her in that system. So, you know, she got started pretty basic, you know, let's just say that the true German system. And um, she didn't, we didn't go very well. And, you know, I basically was told to hit her in the head mm. when she went up so you could, so she won't do it again. And I was just like. Dumbfounded. I, like, I just couldn't. Yeah. I mean, I'm like, I can't. That can't be the solution. <laughs> mm, yeah. yeah. What are we doing? Like, what are we doing? So mm -hmm. I just sort of parted ways in that. And I thought, well, I, I do have this knowledge and, you know, let me be like a different kind of competition rider. So, so way back, I was kind of on this, what my website says. I, I was that for a long time. Got it. But then we kind of fast forward to if you have any questions about that i'm happy to answer the competition <laughs> yeah questions. keep going this is great this is great elaine okay so um i sort of made a you know a niche for myself just being a more empathetic dressage trainer you know mm. um i didn't use draw reins i didn't use side reins i didn't you know just that's not how i was taught original mm -hmm. and i my experience with the with the American dressage was not was terrible. So I was like, well, that well, and the bottom line is, and this has kind of always been my thing, it doesn't work. And I, I understand that, you know, the the Olympians are out there doing it. Some have decent systems, some maybe not, but um those horses are like not okay, in my mm -hmm. opinion. And yes, and there's a cost that is way too high to pay where we're going right mm, now. Mm. So we can talk about how I got to that that conclusion because I was kind of happy to be, I had it, this is, well, for me, it's a, an ordinary story. Um, I had a, a difficult horse. I mean, I think we all had this story. And so that's when I started getting into horsemanship. This is probably like 15 years ago now. So I was just doing the kind of, nice dressage nicely <laughs> competition version and then I had this horse that was um uh just very problematic also reared even though I wasn't doing anything and of course in hindsight I realized this horse has what I now believe to be this very very large problem uh, of course I didn't know that at the time so um I had to learn to do better so I did learn to do better. And of course, he, he got better, but he was never really OK. And I I rehomed him, which I also regret. But it was a friend of a friend. And thankfully, I kind of kept track of him. And he they only tried to ride him. They tried to change him to be a jumper. Um, but they only tried for like six months and he went totally lame and, and they retired him and he lived out with a bunch of horses. So I feel like. Okay, thank God. I and got the lucky problem, there. Um, the problem that you're alluding to, that you suspect that yeah. this horse had, is yeah. uh, ECVM, equine complex vertebral malformation, which I'm all on board on the advocacy for bringing people's awareness to this problem. It's it's an impending disaster. It's already been a disaster, but now we have a diagnosis and an explanation for why so many horses are failing. I've had Bex Nan on the podcast. She discussed it. Um, I've had uh, Elise Mickey on the podcast. I've recorded with her at this time. We're talking, it's not been released yet, but I've recorded with a yeah. Canadian osteopath who's going to set up the, a Canadian arm of a bone, bone examination operation. Um, yeah, that needs to happen up there near Vancouver. Um, and uh, I'd love to have more people. You are coming at this subject from the owner, writer, competitor, trainer mm -hmm. perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And to me right now, anyway, that's, a, um, I mean, that's who I love. Um, thank you for having her as well. Yes. Um, and you got to get Sharon too. You have to get Sharon. Maybe. I've reached out to her, but, but if you can give me an in with Sharon May Davis, an email, I a phone number. Yeah. 
I will absolutely do that. And I'm actually going to her lecture in three weeks. In okay. Aiken, so I'd, I'd, I will talk I'd to her. I'd love personally. to speak with her. I'd love to speak with her. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. Because she is the, she is like the be all end all. If it were the OG. Not for her, I mean, she's totally the OG. Yeah. And, and once you, I won't get into the weeds here, but once you understand what goes on with these dissections, the low neck area, we're talking C6, C7, T1, is even if uh, even with a horse on a regular dissection table, they they don't they won't find this problem unless you're looking, looking for, for it. it. Yeah, because it's under the amount of tissue that lays over this and through this, it makes it impossible to see. And as you know from going to the bone room, thank you for doing that buddy yeah um i was one of the people that were like you gotta go to the <laughs> you were actually you it was you ladies it was you yes. who, who shook me yes. and said lucky i i saw that uh diane is coming to the clinic you've yes. got to go to the bone yes. room and i was like oh i've got time yeah. and i went and i was like oh my god oh my yeah. god it's, it's, oh my god yes, i know right it's one of those things i kind of feel bad a, a little part of me feels bad you know like i'm about to like no more than don't just feel, ruin your day <laughs> no you didn't okay you don't I, I've got a very strong stomach and I have I don't have a a, a very high uh, sorry a very low shock threshold not many things shock me so when I saw the bones I was like yep that makes sense like it didn't shock me in the sense of how graphic it was I didn't feel squeamish I felt humbled I felt yeah. I felt emotional to see their names on the bones yeah and ask about mm. their stories and when yeah. when we read about this one horse charlie i think he was was a very good boy yeah and his body was just a catastrophe you yeah. know um yeah it, it was humbling it was um uh hopeful because i was like okay we've got these resources we've got these answers and i basically turned to the the ladies there i said how can i help how can i help what can I do? Tell me what to do. They were so thankful. They were so thankful for you. Because <laughs> I told them, I said, I think this guy, I didn't know you that well then, but I was like, I think he'll listen. I think he could spread the word, you know, because those ladies too, you got to get them on too, because they, yes, I, they, I'd love to the get the world them will be conquered by like older white women. I'm telling you. Yeah. They're in the, their sixties are the shit. Yes, I mean, they, partnering with young gay insane. guys. That's 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 this is it's, it's a it's it's a partnership made in heaven. Yes, uh, it's an it unstoppable is. partnership, <laughs> and they've got a great sense of humor. And and they they they, do. they really uh they picked on me in the, the most loving way that I remember yeah. d- uh, feeling yeah. that from from uh, friends in Australia. They 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 didn't let me feel too big about myself. They they were great. I loved yeah. it. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're great great yeah, ladies. They're, great ladies. Yeah. And, and the things that they've done there, I mean, this is totally brown, you know, they, they Groundbreaking. found out about Sharon and then mm. they were like me when, and, and you. So when you found out about it, it wasn't that you were shocked. It was like, oh my God, like this uh, makes so much sense. Yeah. 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 Like, I've been this hearing is about what it. was wrong with mm-hmm. my crazy play horse that turned mm-hmm. me on the horse, which, you know, mm. so they are pioneers in their own right. And, um, they are just wonderful humans. So um, yes. I met them for the first time. I had heard about the bone room. I'm um, I'm in North Carolina, that's South Carolina. So it's about three hours mm-hmm. to the bone room. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had heard about the bone room through body workers and other, oh, let me just, I'm just going to put this out here. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've had any body workers on yet, but uh-huh. I... Blessed are the body workers. Mm. Oh, the osteopath, right? Mm. So, I a big, huge shout out to. If it was not for a body worker, I wouldn't know about this. Mm. They, they are the ones that. I mean, I feel it as a trainer now, but they have the expertise in the body and feeling the body that they have been on this from the very beginning because they can feel it you know, and 
so many body workers I know are just like the most fantastic. You talk about horse first, you know, mm-hmm. it's easy not to be a horse first horse trainer, but I'm not sure you can be a body worker and not be horse first. Yes. And they see the damage, yes. right? They see the trauma. So blessed are the body workers. And to yes. anyone that's listening to this, if you're a body worker. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You're amazing. <laughs> yes, yes. I have a couple of clients who are body workers and, um, uh, they are just at the pointy end of the stick all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I do yep. my, I, I, I work with them in the capacity of I'm their trainer and their coach for their private horses and helping yeah. them carve out space in their mind and their heart to enjoy their own horses. Again, after seeing horse after horse, after horse, after horse, who is damaged uh, who is yeah. owned by someone who is determined to ride them come hell or high water, um, yeah. owned by somebody who is not prepared to be a safe steward for the horse if the horse isn't serving them with their body in riding. Um, yeah. And uh, they're at the pointy end of the stick there. And burnout is really real in all yeah. service providers. I mean, throw a dart on a map, there's a burned out equestrian <laughs> service provider within shouting distance <laughs> of that dart. Yeah. Um, 100%. and, uh, that's, that's a big, big problem I'm hoping to address as well, but yeah, I, I wanted, I want to work with you today on trying sensitive of how hard it is for you to talk about this. I'd like, I'd like to hold your hand, link arms with you and try to help you while retaining your dignity and your professionalism to tell the story of the horses and Elaine in their life when you discovered that you had built a house of cards and it all Mm -hmm. came tumbling down. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I'm so glad that you said it like that because that is exactly how how it was a house of cards. A hundred percent. Yeah. So describe the anatomy of that to us. How does it begin? How does pick one of the horses? How did it, begin in archetype you saw a horse you wanted a horse for x purpose found a breeder yes. what how does it begin yes yeah, so i'll i'll start with reggie um reggie was a breeder's horse mm-hmm. um i had just given birth to twins and i had lost some business because i couldn't ride when i was pregnant and this is i'm still in the I'm a trainer. I get paid per ride, you know, that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was sort of like without clients for a little bit, not totally, but I needed some horses to ride. So Mm -hmm. um, there was a local breeder. She was kind of getting out of breeding and she said, yeah, come look at this group of horses. And I, I picked out Reggie and um, we had a deal, you know, um, we kind of were co-owners and then if I sold him, I would take a percentage and she would pay the vet bills and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, it turned out that long story short, I kept him because I realized how talented he was. Um, he was a very, uh, well, at the time I thought, well, he's such a beautiful mover. He's so talented. He's all these things, which, which of course he was. Um, and he got me my gold medal. So he was the horse, you know, I trained, wow. he was a pasture ornament at eight and I trained him up the levels. You got I, him at eight. Quickly. So this was an advanced, advanced no, in age horse. Advanced in age. But see, here's, here's the reason why I think he could be a Grand Prix horse and mm. have what he had because he didn't oh, get started. That was he, the blessing. Got, yes. He got started and then he got thrown out in a field because of the breeder's situation. Mm. So by luck, he, his soft tissues were able to build as much strength as they were ever going to be able to build Yeah, for for a DSLD horse, which is what he had. Um, Fast forward, got him to Grand Prix in four years, ethically, totally ethically. Um, That's how talented he was. Um, now I realize he was hypermobile. He had signs of DSLD from the beginning. This is a li- ligament disorder. I won't, I don't know how much you want to go into that, but um, he served 
wonderfully until 15, where he had his first suspensory injury, and that suspensory injury led to another suspensory injury, led to all sorts of other things. The vet, my vet at the time had actually told me, because I asked about BSLD, and he said, well, his, his ligaments don't palpate, they're not spongy like a BSLD horse. I don't think he has it. And this will probably resonate with a lot of people. <laughs> When somebody tells you something you want to hear, mm. you you kind of like really hold on to that. <laughs> yes, especially when you're looking you're looking at you like your whole world coming tumbling down. When someone yeah. tells you a piece of good news, you grip onto it. Yeah. Yes. So I I had semi retired him. He was still a school horse up until, mm. and I'm going to tell this story real quick. Uh, up until. You don't have to tell it quick, by the way. If you want to take your fucking time (laughs) to tell your story, my podcast is a safe place for taking your fucking time because you earned this time and this space to speak your truth. Elaine, I would never, in this, in this, all my life, I've been told you think too much, you write too much, you talk too much. In the back of my head, I'm thinking your short attention span is none of my business. The people who follow (laughs) me, they've got good attention spans and they want to hear you. So take your fucking time and tell your good story. Go for it. Okay. So my good story is Reggie was a love. Everybody loved him. Anyone could ride him. You could put anybody on this horse. They can Mm -hmm. learn Piaf, Passage, Tempe changes. Uh, He was so, I mean, he was well-trained. I will own that. Like he was light in the back. He was, you know, all the good things Um, until he wasn't. And even then he would, come to the door, come to the gate. He wanted to be ridden. He liked the students. I mean, he he really was even a good boy. almost the very end uh, and a hap- fairly happy horse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in January, he started being late, like late. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then I'm still thinking the vet would kept, I, I called the vet multiple times and the other, this is my lameness vet. Um, and he kept telling me it's the soft tissue, uh, the, you know, the scar tissue will micro tear. And okay, this is not untrue. Okay. But really it's, you know, <laughs> but he just didn't put that stamp on it, which again, we're not going to get into that, but the, the, the thing was one day. So he taught a lesson January 1st. And I think I did try to teach one more lesson on him. January like 21st, he couldn't walk out of his cell. <gasps> so, <laughs> yeah, I thought like, oh, something crazy happened. And I called my regular vet, not the lameness vet, my regular sort of shot, you know, uh, colic vet, um, who is brutally honest and a, a great soul and he watched me get him he did the horse did end up coming out of the stall because he was alone in the barn and he got mad and he struck the wall let me out of my stall so we did he got out there he kind of moved a little better but by the time my vet got here and he watched me take him out of the pasture I just saw the look on his face and I was like oh no (laughs) it was that quick it was that quick that was that yeah so house of cards. I tell this, yes. So I tell this story because it was right after that <laughs> that Jack happened, my ECBM horse. So I think that Reggie, I think that I may have sort of swept the ECBM and the, and Jack a little bit. Oh, it's a one-off. Oh, it's a you know, he's not that bad, but I had just had this experience with uh, Reggie and I was like freshly traumatized. <laughs> right. And so when I found out about Jack, um, which was, well, I heard about ECBM from a body worker like January 30th. So this gives you the timeline. Reggie, the vet came out the 21st and we put him on butte and I put wedge, you know, I booted up my, my hoof boots cause I'm a, I'm a barefoot girl too. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, we put wedges, you know, 
I'm trying to give him, I'm like, I want him to get to summer, you know, where he can like have grass and I won't muzzle him and he'll be, because he was also metabolic. Mm. Um, that was my hope that um, January 30th is when I put him down. And then right after that, the body worker that was working on Jack, and this was like the sixth time she had seen him, craniosacral worker. And she was like, you know, he's just still really sore in his back. And I'm like, I'm not even riding him. How can he be sore in his back? And I didn't understand. And she said, I'm going to link you to an article. And she said, I think he might have that. Mm. And, and it was, um, there was a Hendrix article. Um, I think it's called ecbmallbreeds.com. And it's mm -hmm. it's basically just an outline. And I didn't get lucky. I got three sentences in. And you went, And I just it. like burst into tears. Oh. <laughs> I was like, how can this happen? <laughs> so the house of parts had already kind of fallen. And then this was, you know, like talk about crestfallen. I had listened to that podcast with you talk um to I can't remember her name now about the Bex. client you had. Oh, it was Bex. It was Bex, yeah. The client you had and you, you know, you told them this horse isn't okay. And that 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 crest the crestfallen. Fallen. I mean, it's like the horses, you have so much invested, so much time and so much love and so much money. And so I mean, it's just it's it's so hard. It's so hard. Mm. And then I met Pam, Pam and Diane. Mm. And um, then I, the house of cards sort of like, I don't know, it was already on the ground, but it was kind of like, this was the life changing part for me. Mm. Understanding the magnitude of this. And, and immediately in hindsight, looking back at all these horses, I mean, the, the gray horse was the first horse that I thought about. I was like, he for sure. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. So you've been plagued. And you've been plagued yes. with these horses. Yes. Yeah. In hindsight, many. what percentage? In if you had to guess, forty. Forty percent. Forty. Yeah. Forty percent of my horses, but mm. that's because of what I do. Like, like you said, you don't get horses in training that are like everything's going well. Right. right. So well, that's starting like to that change, too. but until now, generally no, right? People go to trainers right. when they've got problems, yeah. Right. So that's that's when when I realized the magnitude. Well, honestly, when I realized the magnitude, I wanted to quit. That was my first. That was, I just felt like my whole life was built on a lie, mm. and like it wasn't sustainable. Like, how can you do this? How can I do? How? It was seemed it seemed impossible mm. to move forward. And so I'm I'm still a little bit in that um in that space place. of moving forward. Is yeah. It? Yeah. So so forty percent transitioning. Forty yeah. to fifty percent of the horses in your program yeah. have have, ex have this issue. Yeah. And then even horses that it was kind of like a gift that kept giving, the mm. terrible thing that kept giving. Mm. Um, because I would I so badly wanted to believe that the that it wasn't as bad as like Pam was saying it, it might be. Right. Um, so, you know, Stan, the, the horse you have helped me with a few times, he, you saw how he was going. Like he's an, had a very good um, way of going. He is the most functional one by a mile. Like right. he's the most functional one. So, so when people will say, Oh, you know, some of these ECVM horses are functional or they're at competing at the highest level or whatever. Well, he, he did. Yeah. Um, whether he did that comfortably or not, I would argue with that, but, mm. um, mm. he, I didn't think he had it because he was going so good. He didn't have any pain indicators. He, you know, I was thinking I'm doing a great job and, and, and I, and I did. I won't say that I did. You did but, do a um, great job. Mm -hmm. He he was rehabbed. I helped him understand people were not terrible and riding could be fun. And he enjoyed his time with me. And I do feel good about that. And mm -hmm. um, he only got diagnosed because I was wanting to start to do a little bit of collection. And until that point, like when you saw him, you know, he was very long. Open. Yep. Open. Right. 
So, you know, I'm like, okay, well, we're, this is first level. So, you know, cause remember I'm the competition rider. So for mm-hmm. me, everything is rated in the levels, um, which is a good system if people did it the right way. But, um, you know, and I just thought his neck, you know, his neck is kind of a little stiff. I'm sure he has arthritis. I know what he had been through. So, um, you know, let's just take some pictures and see if we, you know, need to help his neck more than I am and and then (laughs) I was like oh there it is again um and I retired him I not right away I tried to help it you know I just I thought he's still happy and then he wasn't happy he had chronic gut issues you know um so he's still here he's retired um I did you had also tried to help me with um turning him out with other horses I did give up on that idea mm-hmm. um he's he's hyper vigilant about his boundaries and his space and he just I tried basically every horse on my farm and it was the horses that could manage to get along with him meaning he didn't attack them and corner them well, they were miserable the other horses right <laughs> you know yeah so yeah 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 I'm yeah. like and knowing what I know about him now, and he also has a pole impingement and he has a ton of arthritis in C5 and probably some channel narrowing. He's neurologic. You know, he always had a lateral tendency in the walk. And even though it got better with the good training I put into him, he still was still a little there. Um, mm-hmm. But of course, you know, his spinal cord is impinged. So, you know, the <laughs> lateral walk is probably, you know, always going to be how he has always been and how he will always be Mm -hmm. um, even though he's relatively happy Mm -hmm. so you know it's kind of been I had another horse a training horse that I thought well she had rehabbed she came from a cowboy a rough cowboy and then a bad dressage trainer and so she had all these issues but she got over all those on the ground after a few months and I thought oh she's great she looked she's fantastic mover and then I sat on her. It took me two weeks to get on her because mm. she was a no to the mounting block mm. for two weeks. We walked, worked through that. Finally said yes to the mounting block. I got on her. Got off the first day. I thought, okay, that went pretty good. Good girl. And then the next day I got on her and asked her to move forward. <laughs> and then I was like, so I don't, the owner, you know, I don't think, I think we need to x-ray your horse. And she was a bilateral, bilateral. And we also think she's missing ribs, which we are going to Oh, boy. Um, yeah. So I still have some of them here. Um, so I would also like to talk briefly about um, what do we do, right? Like, what yeah. Do do? So when, yeah. when you get to the point that you're like, okay, it yes. really is yes 40 to 50 percent like yeah i every so the people that tell me they don't have an ecvm course i tell them you don't know you have you don't know you don't and in my conversation with elise mickey who will be published before yours is published um she uh, alluded to research she's coming across up in canada that it's not just the thoroughbreds and the warm bloods she says it's in Uh, recreational horses too she says it's it's everywhere and yeah um yeah it's it's important that that we We have a morgan a morgan with it too a morgan see literally just yesterday elaine just yesterday i was talking with some colleagues on whatsapp um kim halland down in south carolina and claire aiken who's a saddle fitter at rociante i was talking with them um, and I was like, you know, I think the Morgan people are getting it right. I've never met a Morgan that doesn't look healthy. And you're telling me that Morgans have got this too. Yeah. Shit. This one did. Shit. So yeah, this is important. What Pam said. It is the first, the first Morgan first in the database though. So it's, it's rare. important. It's, it's rare. important that we really, really allow you to tell this side of this story because we've had a different voices here talking about it from different places, but you're talking about it. Someone who's actually had your sleeves rolled up and your hands dirty with these horses and cares and feeds for them every day and has created like low, low key. You have created like a, 
uh, under the radar sort of safe semi retirement for some of these horses, certainly safe training yeah. environment if they are appropriate for that. So what do we do from yeah. here? Do you have any ideas about how to move forwards as an entire community with this issue? I think actually you, when I first found out about it and Pam was telling me the numbers, I thought of you specifically hmm. because, which is one of the reasons why I wanted you to go to the bone room so badly. Um, because I thought if any, because I'm a little bit like, I totally get that. I, I, a hundred percent understand there are so many people out there that the horse is a tool they need to perform a job if the horse can't perform the job the horse is gone she's speaking about just she was speaking about kiwi culture she was speaking about what she deals with in in new zealand absolutely yeah which is yeah it's that's everywhere that's the competition world right my my old competition if you had a horse that wasn't performing you you got rid of the horse but also yes yes that that is everywhere but in new zealand they are one of the most remote countries in the world where this is that's true and the resources yeah resources and finances it's extremely difficult to clinic there because it's very expensive for clinicians to get there and the local community yeah is strapped financially i've just confirmed my first clinic for new zealand so um, oh, I'm, I'm looking forward to to going down there myself and meeting with the people and and seeing what we can do. But um, in in certain remote places, it's even even harder. I would say to a certain extent, um, to a certain extent, my beloved Americans across the Atlantic are blessed to have mm, a- access access to voices, professionals, service providers. Researchers. I mean, the Bone Room is on the doorstep of one of the largest equestrian communities in North America, which is in Aiken and South yeah. Carolina. And they are a very humble kind of uh, throw up. You know, they've got like a just like a, a converted trailer, essentially, and a portaloo, yeah. yeah. like a like yeah. a portaloo, and a few yeah. horses composting under trees and some plastic tubs sitting out in the sun, you know, cleaning up the bone. Yeah. It's very humble. And yet I'm thinking these people locally who are experiencing these problems and don't even know it, there's kind of only rubbish excuses such as pride and prejudice, such as entitlement, mm-hmm. such as elitism, such as I'll say these problems. I won't let you say them because i want to protect your professional uh, uh, integrity there i'll say it you do not have to co-sign it everything i say from here on it may or may not represent the beliefs and values of elaine hayes partnership dressage llc <laughs> <laughs> but there's i will hold them accountable i will say this if someone has access to information and chooses not to learn but continues to exact harm upon an animal and the people associated with it, that person is by category an abuser. That person by category is breaking laws. There is not sufficient enforcement of those laws. And as a human being, I don't know. I could be wrong about this, but it might put you under the category of being a bullshit human being. Might be. I don't know. I'm just asking questions. <laughs> I'm just going to lay that out there. But yeah, like Bex in New Zealand, I totally respect that mm-hmm. she's like totally. she's, like, she's yeah. at that euthanasia point because the, because of the community she's with. Yes. Yeah, a hundred percent. But and, where are you with that? I am in. I am in support of what the owner because you know at the end of the day these horses are in america their property um and if you don't have the resources to care for one of these horses um and you can't find a situation where the horse can be okay and taken care of the way they need to be taken care of then you know to me i will support some i will support the the euthanasia Mm-hmm. when necessary but mm-hmm. i also know that there's a bunch of deeply caring individuals like my clients um that as hard as it was to hear no no nobody here 
you know, rush to put their horse down. And again, I'm not, mm. I'm not judging people mm. that do, but, um, you know, there, are, there is a whole subset. And I think you have a lot of people in your community that um, could really help. Yes. Um, because these horses are, the thing is like Pam and Diane will tell you this. They are, there's not an ugly one. Number one, They're all beautiful I don't know what it death. is about the genes, you know, with the good genes come the bad genes and they're beautiful. They're friendly. Most of them. And even the ones that aren't like the hyper vigilant ones, they, the, the, what my thoroughbred did for me, mm. what he did for me willingly, Mm. humbles you still I, to this day a hundred percent yes i see like, do I not that. take from me yes what mine is mine to freely give wow you know and they will give and give and give and, and give and, and, and you give. see it mm. i went to a clinic yesterday i thought there were two horses there that had it the breeding in one horse is she's related to the horse we have here that has mm -hmm. the bilateral bilateral and um you know it's really hard to be in those spaces, which is why I stopped showing. Mm. Um, it's that alone. Not not even forget the bad training and the Caesar Paras and the mm. all of that. It's um like the these horses that I, I see so clearly. I can I mean I, I you can, can pick it a mile away. You can yeah. pick it. But but you know, then the vets would challenge me on that. And the other trainers challenge me on that. You know, well, how do you, you can't possibly know. I'm like, well, x-ray them, prove me wrong. That's like, called gaslighting. That's called gaslighting and obfuscating. And it's a control mechanism because most people are deeply, deeply afraid and terrified of highly motivated people who have a capacity to learn new information quickly. Most people are very, very frightened of people like that. They are so frightened that we used to get burned at the stake, Elaine, not far from where you yeah. reside. So, yeah. um, uh, you know, it, it runs deep in human culture to uh, burn at the stake, hang, draw, and quarter people who learn very, very quickly, can adapt readily, uh, can pivot immediately into new knowledge and are highly motivated to speak about it. I mean, if you look across at fascism across the centuries, this is the same story ad nauseum on repeat. Who are the first people to get rounded up and sent off somewhere during some sort of regime? It is the people who are the mouthpieces. So when you have a complex, an industrial complex like the Equine Veterinary Association, and there are many, many good professionals and there are many unscrupulous ones, um, and unless they were having their nose into a peer-reviewed study within the last six months, they won't know about ECBM. And not all of them have a have a positive relationship with receiving feedback from their clients when their clients appear to be knowledgeable. Uh, they'll they'll henpeck you, obfuscate, gaslight to put you back into that dumb and helpless role because that's what they're comfortable with you know not all of them yeah. not all i've got a fabulous vet locally he's a surgeon and a lecturer in spain one of spain's largest equine vet training institutions which happens to be 20 minutes away he's a very busy guy he once couldn't come to my farm because he was attending to six emergencies back after back after back after back you know he's oh a great gosh. guy but uh he started when he first coming first came to my farm and my horses have given him plenty of work since we moved here. We've had everything. We've had cancer. We've had colic. We've had abscesses. Yeah, you we've had, had, we've yeah. had the hot, you, you the, have the potpourri. Well, <laughs> I feel like the horses came home and their bodies went, right, we're home. Let's unpack our baggage. Here we go. I've got this. I've yeah, got this. Yeah, I've got this. I've got this. You know, <laughs> I feel like that's what they've all done. So he, he's, he's, we put him to the test. And at the beginning he, and I share this story because I hope someone's listening and they, they seek to copy or be inspired. Let's take a break. Dressage is the French term for training of a horse. And that's what we're really talking about here. It's about horse training and how to innovate horse training. One of the primary advancements in the innovation of horse training is actually the use of food rewards. And yet the use of food rewards has remained a controversial subject. And I use food rewards regularly, but I also feel critical about them because sometimes 
traditional modern approaches to using food rewards to me have felt restrictive or potentially hazardous. So I took a deep dive into some of the science around food rewards and came up with some science that wasn't really being espoused or talked about very often. So I decided to talk about it and then decided to teach it. And it's my mini course that I call When to Reward for What, aka Food Rewards with Freedom. This is the Food Rewards Horse Training course for people who are skeptical about food rewards. It's also a mini course. You're in and you're out in under two hours. No muss, no fuss. I get straight to the point and I get you up to speed with science-backed ways to use food rewards that doesn't necessarily require you to change everything that you're doing, doesn't shame you for using pressure, and doesn't require you to use a clicker either, nor does it require you to constantly feed your horse in order to communicate with them. Though if that's what you're doing, pasanada, nothing happened. There's no shame in that either. But for those of us who want to use food rewards with freedom, I highly recommend coming to join me on When to Reward for What, my mini course on food rewards with freedom. You can sign up to it with the link in the show notes, or you can go to emotionalhorsemanship.com and navigate to When to Reward for What. Now, let's return to my conversation with my friend and colleague, Elaine Hayes. He, and I share this story because I hope someone's listening and they they seek to copy or be inspired. When my vet first started coming to me, it was a little bit, not because he's a bad guy, but a little bit, uh, shut up, a little bit down his nose at us, a little bit, oh, well, if your horses are just, you know, turned out pasture puffs and, you know, because I just had a green field and a house and that was it. Slowly he saw the arena go up and the shelters go up and, and he's like, oh, and then, you know, when he started invoicing me and he saw my business, he was like, oh. And then when um, I said to him, my horse has a lump, he said, how big is it? I said, the size of a pea. He said, I'm not worried about it. I went, okay. I waited 10 days. I said, the lump has grown. He said, nah, I'm mm-hmm. not too worried about that. I said, I'm not worried. I, I was, but I said to him, I wasn't because I know that if I appeared to be in a flap or a worrying, you know, horse mum, there would have been a little bit of a, like a wagging finger, tisk tisk, sit mm-hmm. down, you fretting thing kind of attitude yeah. in my direction. We all know what I'm talking about here. That kind of energy would have been in my direction. So I said, I'm not worried. I said, my horse has a fast growing hard lump under his parotid gland. I'm requesting for you to come and take it to biopsy it. And then when he was at the biopsy, I had to ask again, please take it because he was attending for something else. He was halfway out the door. I said, sorry, I need you to take this. Now, thank God my horse is well behaved because he just stood in my hands, no sedation and had open neck surgery, no sedation, just stood in my hands, just total trust, just, just, just a local anesthetic. That was all. He just stood there blinking, looking at me, said, I trust you. It's okay and sent it off. He said, oh, you know, he didn't think it was a big deal. He just thought it was just like a fatty growth or an inflammation. He thought it might've been genetic because he's a draft horse or something. You know, sometimes they can be that way. Came back as a white aggressive cancer and um, we got it all and we got it early. And how many times did I have to advocate with my vet Mm -hmm. for him to, to do that? And if, if yeah. I was a different kind of person, if I wasn't a pushy bastard when it came to my horse's well-being, <laughs> if I wasn't a loud-mouthed, insufferable, talk too much, think too much, horse-loving, tree-hugging, granola-crunchy, uh, pasture-puffy, uh, fucking freak, according to the industry, if I wasn't that, my horse would still have a rapidly growing cancer and it would have been too late. So anyone out there, yeah. Please find ways to respectfully communicate with our vets, but know that you are not a patient. You are not to be patient about it. You are a medical consumer for your horse's behalf, and your job is to advocate if something concerns you. And I had to say to my vet, I I looked him square in the eyes. I said, I'm an equine professional. I'm not a vet, but I know my horses. I know my horses. He's not right. My horse is not right. 
I need you to do something about it. And now I have a great relationship with this vet. He's fabulous. He's always been fabulous, but he takes me seriously now and he listens to me. Right. Right. And that, that happens. I, I can't tell you, uh, you know, I'm going to be 55 this year that I, that has happened just thousands of times. Now. <laughs> and, and the thing that the vets need to realize is we, you do know your horse best and, and we have the window. I see these horses all day, every day for years. Right. Like they're just looking at my horse once, to, you know, shots twice. Right. A week. You know, I mean, they just right. don't know. Right. And, and, you know, I mean, I, I hope this is changing too. I really do. And yes. there are vets out there that recognize that these are problems. But as Cam will tell you, it's, it is like pulling teeth with some of them. I mean, they don't, they didn't learn about it in vet school. It right. <laughs> That's it. You All know, these people are just looking for an excuse. They're just looking for an excuse, Lockie, not to, not to train their horse, you know. And yeah. that's, I call bullshit on that. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. I'll call bullshit on that with you. I, this is how we can do it. I had a, um, a follower on Instagram, write me. Cause when I went to the bone room, I took lots of photos and videos and I shared that to my Instagram stories. And then I saved that stories. Cause you can save story highlights on Instagram. People can mm. go back retroactively and see all those stories. So you can go to my Instagram, emotional.horsemanship, and you can see the stories from the bone room and what I annotated there. And I, I should have done it a lot better, but I was so busy learning. I, I forgot half the time to bring my phone out. Um, and the, the story highlight is called heavy because it is, it's heavy stuff. And when yeah, I, I post, remember, I remember, you that, remember yeah. that I posted it yeah. at the time and I had a follower in Germany write to me and say, hi, my grandfather, I showed these to my grandfather because he's an equine vet. I live in Germany. My grandfather's shaking his head at me and getting a bit, you know, kind of blustery with me because he says, he's never heard of the thing. Never heard of it. I've been an equine vet all my life. You know, um, never heard of it like this. Yeah. I said and German too. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I love me some German, but if you get on their wrong side, history. <laughs> let's see, anyway. Um, I won't go there. Um, and I've lived and worked in Germany, by the way. So I just thought I'd put that on the table. I've lived there. I lived in East yeah. Germany in a small town. Small town. I speak German. Anyway, so I um I said to her, I said, "Great, can you please send me an email? Send me an email, and I'll share with you." the PDF that Pam and Diana produced in the bone room. It's a PDF designed for vets and owners to rapidly bring them up to speed on what the problem is. And within two pages or less, show them what the protocol is for diagnosis. If possible, I said, I will gladly share that uh, with your grandfather. And I said, Oh, and by the way, I just went to Google scholar typed in ECVM, just went copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, anything that was peer reviewed put that on the email too. I said, here are the recent studies. Here's the study that came out a few weeks ago, because I know the ladies who published it and it only came out a few weeks ago. So here's the information. Please send that to your grandfather. And she said, sent it to my grandfather in Germany. He said, thank you very much. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. That's interesting. Yeah. And if more people yeah. could get to I that mean, they, place. They, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it is really hard and it, it's one of those, um, I, I, I butt up against it a lot and it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, well, and what do you think motivates that pushback? I think part of it is the vets kind of don't want to, well, they definitely don't want to deal with it. I mean, they, they, it's, there's nothing I mean, this is a little doom and gloom, but there really isn't that much you can do about it. I mean, there's no, the bones are the bones and the, mm -hmm. the soft tissue, the, you know, when you go to a dissection, the, the, the soft tissue is what really stands out and the, mm -hmm. the brachial plexus, the nerves are, I mean, it's, you know, but there's, I think the vets want to help, you know, I mean, that's their profession. And um, I just think, you know, the, the the industry what you know writ large the breeders the vets the this the powers that be the system is is you know it's so widespread I think they don't want to acknowledge it they they don't want the crestfallen <laughs> clients that 
half of their clients. That or and they don't have the capacity. I want to make sure where I, I don't present as ableist here. I think, well, I don't think we know that the veterinary career has the highest percentile of suicide per any career internationally. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. it, can you imagine being at the worst end of the stick for the lives of animals in a human world? You just see the worst machinations of the human brain played out on the bodies of innocents every day. Yeah. You see the yeah. worst aspects. You see even the garden variety worst aspects, just plain old neglect through ignorance. If you see that year in, year out, day in, day out, it it brings you down. And then now they have to deal with a tidal wave where it's not like, okay, yeah. 4% of horses might have this issue. Okay, they'd pick up a peer review yeah. study, they'd read about it, put it away for future reference in the back of their brain. Yeah. But to consider the possibility that 40 to 60% of the horses on their books and maybe more because these horses often have yeah. comorbidities. And so through selection bias, it might be more, what, 70, 80% of their clients might have this as a comorbidity or, or it might be driving other pathologies. Yeah. And, and they're already up up to here yeah. in their nervous system with what they can uh, deal with, tolerate, hold space for, have capacity for. How can we ask a burned out, overextended community of knowledgeable people to help? We can't. So who's going to do it? We, I mean, that's, that's you, where it falls. You people like me. yourself. <laughs> people like yourself. Yeah. And advocating for the horses. That's all I do. That's all. That's yes. really all I do. Yes. I just... Yes. advocate for the best possible situation for every horse that uh -huh. I come across. Yes. Including horses at clinics and telling yes. people things they don't want to know. And yes. Gently and kindly and with, you know, sensitivity. Um, and, and I'm getting better at the pushback. Like, cause in the beginning I wasn't, I couldn't like, I was super couldn't deal. I couldn't mm -hmm. No, at all, like at all. So I, and I'm still a little in that space, but I am trying to, you know, I feel like this conversation with this lady at the clinic went pretty good. And I'm, you know, <laughs> I wasn't like crying when I was walking away. So, you know, progress, progress. <laughs> I love it. My comment section on my social media is always safe for Elaine Hayes to drop by and advocate for ECVM as something these people should be looking into. I will always have that space for you and I will come up to bat for you every day of the week on this subject because it's such an important problem. I have so much respect for you as a as a writer, as a professional, someone who had the house of cards come tumbling down 40% of your horses past and present diagnosed with this issue more or less overnight, more or less overnight. What does your, yeah. what does your program look like today? I understand it is in change. Yes. What does your it program is. look like today? So um, last fall when I sort of um, got a little healthier view, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I decided to take a deep dive into breeding. Um, not I'm breeding horses, but pedigrees. So when when my thoroughbred died, um, I ran his lines for horses that we that are uh, proven to have ECVM. So these are horses whose skeletons are on display mm -hmm. in various places. Famous horses like mm -hmm. Eclipse. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I plugged all of those horses in line by line, Lockie. This <laughs> you can imagine how long this took. Um and I discovered some pretty interesting things, which I um I'm planning on writing a book of about <gasps> experience. Love and that for it, you. What a great idea. 
yeah, I mean, it's like it's such a complicated story and a complicated subject, and it's like new, so I can't like mm-hmm. prove anything. And it, but I can tell people my story, and I mm-hmm. can tell people what I did, mm-hmm. and you know, not most people aren't going to spend thirty hours researching the horses. <laughs> Right. I, right. I did that, but mm-hmm. the, most people aren't going to do that. Um, but the other thing, so I I do offer that as a service now. You um, research pedigrees? Yes. Yeah. So it's it's not. I didn't know this. Difficult. It's just yeah. So this is my new. This is one one of my new offerings. Is um because so here's here's the thing. Here's the disclaimer. This is all speculation. Okay, so they they haven't isolated the genes yet, although Pam will tell you it's more than one. Um, And what I suspect is it's so widespread at this point, like we'll never, I mean, even once they isolate the genes, it's going to be a matter of how- Which gene? How much outbreeding comes Mm. into the picture. Do you know Mm. what I'm saying? Like every horse has, every horse at your barn, Lockie, has these horses in their pedigree Mm. but is it five times or is it 500 times because Mm. that's what we're talking about Ah, Um, ah. with my anecdotal research (laughs) so i feel like i have to put this disclaimer out there um but for instance my thoroughbred i don't think people understand i know that people give lip service to these horses or inbred but you you cannot possibly imagine when i started researching it i was like you are fucking kidding me. I Brothers mean, and cousins and uncles, and that's also my sister oh, and my mother and the, the whole thing. It is Urkel Durkel. It's Urkel Durkel. So bad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's so bad. It's mm-hmm. so much worse than anybody thinks. Like, wow. It's so bad. So like my uh, thoroughbred had eclipsed. So now we're talking, this is the late uh, 1700s. So this is a long time ago. 55,000 tons, lucky. 55,000 tons. Like there's no way, <laughs> there's no way that you can have a healthy animal that has the same lines so widespread in the pedigree. I mean, it's mm-hmm. just, it's like imp- the fact that there are some horses that are out there with pedigrees I've run that don't have ECVM is really more notable than the fact that they do, honestly. So I also offer for breeding people who want to breed a horse. I know you might thinking about breeding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, this is such a great service. Because there are some horses. Yeah. That need to not get bred to anymore. Like, and um, I also, yeah, know a lot of not just ECVM, but neck horses, channel narrowed horses, kissing spines, you know, stop wobblers, breeding them. Stop hole breeding. impingement. Yeah. String hold. We need to stop reading them, but but lucky these. And I am. If I told you the names of these sires, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's it's like okay. The, the industry is going to push back super hard. Oh, of course they are. So I have a horse at home who was gelded just over a year ago. He comes from uh, Yaguada Centurion in Sevilla, which is mm. owned by some. The owner is a, a famous football player, millionaire. Um, Mm. and has a penchant for horses. They produce hundreds of horses a year down in Seville. Just, it's a factory. It's all artificial insemination. A lot of the embryos are dealt with in labs. It's all experimental. And what they're trying to do, in my understanding, um, and low-key in Europe, they have a reputation for producing Frankenstein horses. Um, But uh, that's, that's what... I've heard, uh, I won't say name, but I've known certain very high class professionals won't buy from Yagoada Citurion because they say they produce Frankenstein PREs. But um, what they're trying to do is to create large, scopy PREs to compete with the Euro dressage market because the PREs are such beautiful movers, so easy to collect, naturally fluid, naturally expressive. They've got all that in droves. The only reason why they're not the the horse of choice for a competitive rider is is because uh, they should be between fifteen two to sixteen three hands, not more. I mean, for centuries, that's 
that's how they should be. And if you look at the research of Dr. Deb Bennett, she uh, talks about, um, yeah. you know, bigger is not better, that pound for pound, once you get above a certain height and weight in a horse, their their joint integrity breaks down and that the perfect height is somewhere between, you know, 14 to 15, three, something like this. So they're trying to breed these big horses. So along comes Sorenio, who is bigger than his father, bigger than his mother. He's just this big bruiser, you know, with a big old neck. And they said, oh, we'll, we'll keep him. We'll breed him. And so they were, um, they did breed him. He's, he's got kids out there. Um, and then when he came to me, because he had reoccurring problems then I need to get his neck x-rayed, um, he has no arthritis, um, when they x-rayed him four and a half years ago, but I wonder what's going on now. And it's I'm, worth, it's worth, doing. I'm, it's worth doing. And I'm, I'm going to speak to my vet about lower neck as well. When I get back from my clinic tour, it needs to happen. I need to check it with him. But, um, when he came to me, I found out that he had one testicle. I said, oh, what's going on there? I thought he was, I thought he was the stallion. He has one testicle. I said, yeah. oh, and uh, the best I could get out of anyone. And I really shook everyone down. Everyone who ever knew this horse, I shook them down. I, I was, again, pestering, insufferable, demanding uh, advocate, asking people who just want to keep their lips closed to advocate. And they, 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 they only could give me the answer that they knew, which was he lost it at an, in an accident. I said, what accident? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. I even wrote, yeah. mm -hmm. I wrote to Yaguada Centurion with his passport number and microchip and said, oh, do you have on file what the accident was? My canny vet in Granada province, he looked at that horse and he just went, nah, no way. I know what they did. He's totally... Uh, this is only a presumption. It's only speculation. He believes that um, because of his size and because of his father is fair bago, dressage say. champion. <laughs> his so father bad. is fair bago, so dressage bad. champion. His mother was a morphology champion. He's from the Hall of Kings and he's over 17 hands high at three years old. Okay. Uh, he's got one testicle. Ah, someone can just go shook, shook on a piece of paper and that can disappear. That's what my vet thought was going on. That's not my opinion. I do not espouse that opinion. I share that opinion for informational and educational purposes only. Um, but as soon as I saw that there was one testicle only, I went, oh, mm, because people are saying, why won't you breed him and keep semen? No, I went, no, one testicle straight to the, straight to the hospital, We're gelding straight away. Yeah. And there's so many, there's so many stories like that of, of just all sorts of problems that get swept under the rug or, or, I mean, I personally think they, they know the European breeders, they know, they know. <laughs> you know, these necks of these horses, this hypermobility, this, I mean, I just did a post about it the other day of people, you know, what they think of as this wow factor. It, it's not healthy. It's not wet. It's, it's not, not wow. It's disease and breaking down, and it's as bad as the horses crashing on the track. Yeah. I mean, it's just a slow moving train wreck. Slow motion and, train. Know, yeah, exactly. What are those breeders in Spain? They're insane. That's insane. Yeah. Why it's, would you it's add bad. hypermobility to a breed that's already? Why would you Mobile. add? It's bad. I don't know why. Um, a lot of horses have a lot of problems here. We did find out with Sereno that, um, cause I, I watched the entire surgery. You can go to my YouTube channel and you can watch part of the surgery. You can go to my Patreon and watch the entire surgery. The, um, the two vets, uh, looked for the second testicles. We thought it was, he was a crypto kid, right? Um, so they looked, they also looked for signs of a previous, uh, surgery even if that was right, a, right. a right. keyhole surgery, they even, they looked for right. signs that anything had been taken. They found no scar tissue, no signs of incision, no nothing, and no other testicle inside. So we removed this one enormous size of a melon testicle. And then three months later did a testosterone test, no testosterone in, in his body. So he was actually born a monorchid. So born with one testicle, oh, which is exceedingly okay. rare, exceedingly rare, but he was breeding. Right. And that's which is illegal. It's illegal according to the, the Anthe. 
they if if a horse is born like that, they're supposed to never be a qualified to breed, but someone qualified him. Well, the one of the ECVM lines in my research that shows up is a mare called Pocahontas. Mm. She was a roarer. She mm. was a roarer. She had oh, eighteen no. offspring, Ugh. three of whom are the most widely bred thoroughbreds. You can Ugh. they're everywhere. And so you're breeding brothers to sisters to cousins over and over and over and over Urkel again. Durkle. With a Urkel horse Durkle. that was originally a roar. Sick. <laughs> Urkel Durkle. It's just Urkel Durkle. And they call us crazy yeah. for, for for calling for you know better breeding practices. Have you found yeah. breeders with better practices? Yes. I have had oh. private I have people reaching out to me privately. Mm-hmm. And I want to reach out to more private breeders because to me, the big, you know, here we have, we don't have actually that many like state studs or not like in Germany, but um, there's like Hilltop Farm. There's a couple large breeding farms and um, they're just, to me, it's, it's kind of a bridge too far and Mm -hmm. to start more grassroots and get Mm. people who want to sell to people that want sound horses, but my, my goal before that, put back up, um, is to teach people wh- why that movement that is in the Olympics, you don't want that. Mm-hmm. And because people don't see it. I don't think people understand. So I want to educate, mm-hmm. um, Thank you, you know, maybe an online course on hypermobility. Oh, or my goodness. Something. We need what to is, help you. We need to help you. Yeah. We need to help you do what that. What is healthy? What is not? Yes. How can we make these horses live to be 30? Horses should be ridden past their mid 20s. This should yes. be fine. They should yes. be healthy. Yes. And they're not. So And coming from you because you've been there. It's not like they can I've just they, they they can't they they can disregard me. They don't even know I live and breathe in the world because I'm not interested in in playing their game. But you've been there. You've you've stood shoulder to shoulder with these people. You've come back from that place, and now you're telling a different story. It's very very important that we listen to you, support you, and um, I don't know. You should reach out to my friend Christiane, see what she can do to to help you uh, push things forward in terms of online. Yeah, courses absolutely. And business. She does. Yes, for sure. Yes, mm-hmm. I did. I had had a coaching call with her. So amazing, beautiful. All right. Yeah, she's Sh- great. We're going to start rounding out the podcast, if that's okay. Um, I have three little questions I like to take everybody through just to bring closure to our conversation. The whole conversation has been about this. So if you want to just reiterate this, you can encapsulate it. You can speak to something else. But what is something you would like to muck out in the equestrian industry? If you had that power to lift it, scoop it, remove it, what would that be? Um. I would say, I mean, there's a lot, right? <laughs> yes. So if I had to narrow down to one thing, it would be the normalization of pain indicators. Mm. I want to muck that up. Love that. Yep. I will muck that up with you too. The base of these problems is that people do not see, like Bex was talking about, it's subtle. It's subtle, but it's not. It's not, not if you're paying attention. Not if you're paying not. attention. Right. I'm thinking to, I should probably reach out to Dr. Sue Dyson, who has the 24 behaviors yes, of, a, of a ridden horse in pain on her ethogram. I'd love to get, I know even she's a controversial figure. Of course she is. Anyone worth listening yeah. to has, has a modicum of controversy surrounding yeah. them at least at some point. And I'm point thinking now. about breaking, breaking those down myself with horse, my own horses. Cause I Amazing. have all of them. <laughs> Amazing. And, you know, to put it even more, you can't have too much of this information out there. Mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. And second question is uh, the tide of change. You can either describe how you are contributing towards this tide of change or encapsulate it, describe what it is to you? I think that I'll describe what it is. I think that it is a growing awareness, a grassroots movement of people listening to their horse and the horse is telling them, you know, we need help, we're not okay. And I think there is a growing movement of people that are willing to step up to the plate and do the right thing. Mm. 
against, you know, what has been long considered industry standard. So that's my definition. Hope. That's what I think is, is happening. People want to do better. Yes. Yes. I love that. I love that. And I agree with that. I see that too. And um, lastly, in an age of learning journeys, certainly you've been on one and it's a journey you didn't <laughs> want to take. It no. was like, it was like getting on a really turbulent plane to nowhere, yeah. you know, right. or you getting, get getting on a turbulent plane to the middle of nowhere, you know, to right. desert island. in an age of learning journeys, what is home for you? What is something that has stayed unchanged through and of a comfort to you through all of this? Has anyone not said horses? <laughs> I've only listened to a couple of podcasts so far. But it seems to me that um, people in this community, I can't imagine it not just being, I wouldn't be doing any of this. Hmm. Just being with, just seeing my horse, brushing him, <laughs> yeah, you know, knowing that he's happy and healthy and even the ones that aren't healthy, even, you know, I, you know, the joy that he has in small things, knowing his time might be limited. I have joy in those things, hmm. you know, I mean, who knows how long any of us have, honestly, yep. you know, and it's just why we do this right i mean yes it certainly it's is looking out sitting in the pasture cleaning the stall <laughs> that's reality to me that's the truth that's where i live that's what's home to me and in this crazy time with so much change so much to integrate so much to adapt to thank god there remains so much of the mundane, the beautifully, wondrously mm. mundane in and around an equestrian life. The fact that they they bookend your day with feed routines, care routines, that you, if you love horses, you can look at them, not ask anything and be happy. And I'm so grateful that they are in essence down to earth, no matter how kicking off things might get for us sometimes that we always bring it back yeah. to that place and it keeps all of us tethered. Love that. Yeah. Elaine yeah. Hayes, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I will have in the show notes, your website where people can get in contact with you, your social media, where people can see your work at partnership dressage. It's really, really beautiful what you're doing. If people want to get, I in do touch, have, I do have a mess. I, um, I should have told you this earlier. My yeah. You see the Facebook page. Ah, so beautiful. I have a group, a group to join if you want to find out more about BCBF awesome and awesome. people's stories and horses and all that. So awesome. We're going to put in the show notes, everything you want to share with us and everyone needs to run, not walk towards Elaine if they're in a breeding operation and would like to engage her to check uh, bloodlines on, on their behalf. She can, we can help at least not continue to breed these horses if we can. So um, keep doing what you're doing. I'm really glad to know you. And I guess I'll see you in a few weeks at the clinic. No, yes, you're coming to order? Long. Yeah. Yes, Looking absolutely. To it. absolutely. Beautiful. Beautiful. Of course. Thank you. And have a great Thank day. Thank you, Lachie. It's my pleasure. You too. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Emotional Horsemanship Podcast. I am your host, Lockie Phillips, and that was my friend and my guest, Elaine Hayes. You can find out more about Elaine Hayes and Partnership Dressage and the services she provides by visiting her social media provided in the links of the show notes. And you can explore my food rewards course for people who are skeptical of food rewards by going to my website and toggling to the when to reward for what course or clicking in the link in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and if you can leave me a review i really appreciate it thank you for being here and i hope to see you next time